Hi, hello everyone. We are really happy to be here sharing with you our experience with the portfolio implementation at this day. It was really a journey with a lot of lessons learned that we want to share. But without any further spoiler, let me introduce Best Day. Best Day is a travel company. We are based in Mexico. And we have four business units with customers both in the business to consumer and business to business segments. And we have more than 2,500 employees. And in particular, we had a product development team of 150 team members divided into around 25 product teams. And I'm Nacho Vasino. I'm Chief Product Officer uh, in, in Best Day. I've been working in product management for more than 10 years, and I'm particularly passionate about uh, helping teams be more successful and build better products. And for that reason, over the last four years, I've been trying to share my experiences through coaching, conferences, trainings, and writing in my personal site, linuxorientation.com. But I'm here as a guest. Uh, today, the true soul of the Kanban party at this day is Alejandro. Thank you, Nacho. Uh, my name is Alejandro Rodriguez. Uh, I'm really passionate about business agility. I've been doing uh, software development for over more than 20 years. And uh, I'm really committed to help uh, organizations deliver value in a more predictable way at a sustainable pace. And of course, I am a Mexican taco lover. <laughs> And uh, well, I'm sharing also my thoughts and experience at uh, Cognify.com.mx. So uh, without further review, uh, let me introduce you to what was Best Day uh, in 2015, a little bit long, long time ago in a galaxy that not much far away in Cancun. Uh, we used to have a PMO and uh, it honestly felt like, you know, uh, we have a lot of projects, we have a lot of demand of projects and it felt just like this, you know what? We need to build an empire fleet, right? And if a project manager there to ask, okay, but we have a lot of work in progress, what first? Uh, the common answer will be, well, we need everything and we need it ASAP, right? Sounds familiar? So uh, our performance so far, we were able to meet 45% of the demand. And uh, well, we forecasted uh, uh, increasing demand rate of 178%. So that, that is a lot, right? So there is no economics uh, of you know keeping growing at that uh, at that pace to maintain the demand versus the capacity, and uh, of course this was not uh, sustainable. So by that by that time uh, there were already three key players in the ecosystem. Uh, we already had a PMO. There was uh, uh, Scrum teams already there. Uh, there, I mean we have already tried twice to implement Scrum. And uh, in 2017, there was a new kid in town, and the, the, the Kanban team, right? Uh, I want to be honest with you guys, because uh, I served the, the Empire. I, I was a project program manager. And uh, for, a, for a period of time, of course, I also was Scrum master. Then I became an, an, an agile coach. And I thought the problem was me, right? Because I am uh, the, the commune the denominator be behind all this story. So uh, there was a period of equilibrium uh, in, in regard that, you know, we already had this big, big PMO in place. And if we wanted to introduce uh, a new concept or new method, the Kanban method, we, we knew we needed to isolate it, uh, a pilot test, right? Because otherwise the ecosystem will, will eat for breakfast the, uh, the new uh, Kanban implementation. So what we did, we, we created this concept of a Kanban pod. Kanban pod was sort of a cross-functional team uh, with a mission of delivering one project with a fixed date of four months. So uh, it was agreed that uh, if we were able to deliver that project, uh, then we'll get something that we needed. And that was, uh, you know, get the idea of if the Kanban method may work for us or not. So uh, this is, me implementing Kanban board at what we call now Kanban maturity level number zero, oblivious. Uh, this is me with, uh, you know, sweating still a little bit of project management. You can see the blue sticks, those were uh, features and the yellow post-its were uh, mainly tasks. So uh, we were limiting tasks actually, but uh, even, even though we were, we were not doing the full thing Kanban stuff, we were able to successfully limit WIP uh, a, on, a, on a regular basis. And uh, the result was that uh, we were 
able to deliver most of those user stories in eight days or less, the 85% that you can see it over there, 85% uh, of, all, of all that work was finished in eight days or less, so not that bad. And our process was uh, pretty stable. You can see that on the cycle time histogram. So we got what we needed and that was social proof, right? I mean, we were able to deliver that project in three months uh, or less. And uh, well, we were ready to roll. I was already excited, you know, to get to the other teams and, you know, share my knowledge and experience and how we were able to deliver in, uh, in, in, in less time. Uh, so I was pretty happy. Uh, and then I began, you know, um, canonizing uh, one team. And this is me overreaching. <laughs> you can see that image where I wanted to measure everything. There was uh, this big concept of uh, the workflow. And honestly, I was really into measuring the um, flow efficiency. I wanted to spot uh, where the bottleneck was. And uh, to be honest, I did not involve as much as I should have uh, the team in all this uh, work. So lessons learned for me. Then uh, I did it the right way. You know, the right way is of course, uh, doing through static, system thinking approach to introducing Canva to the teams. So uh, we did that for 18 teams in 2018. And uh, well, there you have it. Uh, you know, we looked for the uh, capacity versus the demand, the workflow, the motivation for change and all that cool stuff from static, right? And well, this is us, not, not me. This is the team building uh, his own Kanban board uh, in, back in the day. And uh, of course, I am a um, metric freak. I, I love to measure everything. So uh, this is our user story cycle time for those 18 teams. And we started, uh, you know, delivering uh, user stories at 71 days or less. That, that is the 85 percentile. So um, we had a long way to go still. So seven months later, jumping on the, on the Millennium Falcon and bada bing, bada boom, bada bam, we really improved our visualization. You can see that we can, you uh, can see the upstream, you right? You can see the downstream, you can see the explicit policies over there, the pool stages, whip limits, uh, classes of services, uh, different work types. We, we thought we had everything, metrics, uh, it was really cool. Uh, different types of uh, Kanban boards emerge within our, our, our organization. You can see there is the uh, Avengers team. We have M&Ms, we have Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, you name it. It even became like a big competition of, uh, within teams of who had the coolest uh, Kanban board in town. That, that, that is a Mario Bros, for, for instance. Uh, there was teams that even celebrated the first year that they, uh, you know, were using this Kanban board. You can see there's uh, the cake, pretty cool. Uh, but what about metrics, right? And this is where the fun begins. I mean, we uh, should be already agile, whatever that means, right? So we had a nice trend from January to May. You know, we were, you know, uh, getting faster. Uh, and then something happened. And uh, how come we were supposed to be the chosen ones, right, Nacho? Yep. So. At this time, was when C3PO joined the company, or the CPO joined the company. Actually, I joined in March 2018, so I kind of see this uh, this trend unfold. But it was interesting because, from my perspective, even when the teams were really excited, uh, the things were not looking that good. Um, the main problem was that stakeholders were not really convinced about this change. So they are being sold now that we are having. A, convert, a transformation to a product-driven organization. That was why I was hired. But they are thinking that we have gone through three or four transformations at this point. We have been doing Kanban, Scrum, uh, pods, uh, product. They just do not differentiate. So they are very skeptics. And even though the CEO was very active promoting the product and Agile concepts, we still have a long way to go in terms of competing through results. So one of the even bigger problems was that some of the key players of our own team were not truly convinced of this uh, product rebellion we are trying to, to bring to the table. So for instance, uh, product managers, who are of course a, a key team player to, to make this information happen, they are coming through different places in the organization and they are still mostly project managing. And that's what they do, that's what they know. And 
most of the other team members are seeing them as these uh, leader figures in a more kind of control, kind of command and control way. They are seen like this stormtrooper figure. So what we need, we truly need to do is a transformation in terms of culture. But uh, this, this from March to what Alejandro just showed us, uh, a few months uh, gone have gone, and we have we kind of diagnosed the situation a bit deeper. So at this moment, we see a bigger challenge, bigger threat uh, upcoming, a new Death Star that's building. And that's that we are building on top of a company that has a lot of history. It's a 35-year-old company. So we have a lot of technical debt accumulated. So we have been building software for all those many years. And in the PMO structure, we are building project on top of project on top of project. And we have this very obsolete way of practices to build software. So at this moment, we realized that we did very painful changes to, to actually achieve true agility. And one of the most iconic ones, I think, was adoption of the DevOps culture of DevOps practices. And we had to fully disintegrate our traditional operations department. We incorporated most of the people into, for instance, development departments. But some practices like testing and releases were, were still manual. So we, to, to build and release one piece of software, we can take almost a month just to release that software. So what we did was to go through these painful transformations and we started very, very quick, very fast, introducing all this uh, transformation and all this automation in terms of doing these 25 projects be more agile. So at this moment, what we feel is that we have this traumatic path from our young selves to our old selves to go through. It's the only way to achieve through agility, but we as leaders need a way to actually give product managers, technical leaders, agile coaches, a way to mature in their own practices. And uh, talking about getting matured uh, at that time, 2018, I think it was, a good friend of mine brought me this book from a link conference, uh, conference and uh, I should, I thought I should give it a try because we were aiming to, you know, uh, getting some uh, more deeper level of maturity in our, at the our organization. So uh, we started talking about the Kanban maturity model and the benefits behind it, behind its it practices. And uh, well, after five months of introducing practices uh, from KEMM level one, level two, uh, uh, um, Kanban maturity model wise, well, we improved, right? From 71 in February, we were now delivering user stories in 47 days or less. That Remember, that is the 85% out of all those uh, 18 teams. But uh, we have a goal, and the goal was to deliver in four, 14 days or less. So we still have a long way to go. Uh, just to share some thoughts uh, of our two service delivery review, there were two key uh, takeaways. The first one, it was really hard limiting work in progress. I mean, you guys know that. Uh, it, it, it's it's just a simple practice, but it's really hard to master, right? So that was one key takeaway. And the other thing was that if you look at that uh, histogram, you can realize those uh, big outliers uh, and on, on that fact, big tail of, uh, and, and that mainly meant dependencies and blockers, right? So we knew we, we needed to do a better job that in, in that regard. But at this moment, we are kind of running out of time. So we have been one year through this process and the stakeholders have not seen great results, uh, even though they are doing a big, a big investment. And even worse, we are kind of getting worse in some, in some respects. We are introducing a lot of change. I was saying that we were kind of transforming all the roles and all the practices. So we are introducing a lot of chaos to the system. And what we start seeing is that our teams are spending a lot of time actually fixing production. And this is a metric we introduced in 2019. We don't have the, the benchmark of 2018. That was even worse. But we are seeing that teams are spending, this, that's a, the gray line, and they are spending more than 30% of their time actually fixing production rather than building software or building the innovation we want to, to bring to the table. So what we think we need at this moment is to actually have a more uh, visualization of what's coming next, uh, a way to show stakeholders the light at the end of the tunnel but also for us, because we have 25 teams working in what can be seen as different directions, maybe not different directions completely, but they are working in different initiatives. 
And one of the key issues for us is that dependencies are starting to, to bring conflict to the table. We, are have, we still have a very tightly coupled software. So when one team is working in something and they need to work with another team, they need to share priorities and that's not always the case. And sometimes a team start working in some, in some initiative and they find a new roadblock and that's something that kind of stalls and we are seeing that the entire system work in progress starts to grow. At that moment, what we try to do with the with the heads of products is to start doing some road mapping and visualization of the work, again, just to give some stakeholders some visibility of what's coming next. And they start working with the product managers and some visualization tools to put these roadmaps in place. But this practice is still very unconnected from the Kanban practice. So what the roadmap is telling us is not connected to what the teams are seeing in their boards. And this is when we start thinking about, or, or the head of products working with the leadership coach, so I think about implementing a portfolio. Um, and this is our, our first uh, I would say attempt, our, our initial step, was kind of visualizing what we had. And we created this card for, for, the, for the initiative. And at this moment, what we call initiative can take a team from three to five months to complete approximately. So we have 25 teams and look at there, you have more than 60 cards probably, and this work in progress. So it's not something that we plan to do. So we have almost, uh, this was the aha moment. We have 60 things going on. And this is the, when visualization becomes realization that something needs to change to, for us to, to come up with this. So now, uh, this time I perform static on a portfolio level. So this is, this is me not overreaching on the workflow. I want to start it really simple. Uh, the stages were, you know, what are the next ordered objectives? Then on the final stage, uh, breaking down those big initiatives into user stories and then uh, doing some forecasting uh, since we already had some data uh, in order to know if we were able or not to deliver on the, the deliver those initiatives for the next three months. And then there is the commitment point, definition of work, definition of ready. Uh, the major improvement that we introduced on uh, the ticket design for a portfolio card was mainly doing some risk profiling over there. You can see it. We wanted to know if things that uh, we, were, we were getting started were not too risky and we were having conversations around that. Uh, also, we designed this uh, Kanban portfolio stand-up uh, cadence, where mainly it was discussed, uh, the, of course, the, the progress, but also uh, just to making sure that we were all online of uh, starting the right things at the right time, and uh, of course, talking about uh, blockers or, or, or impediments, right? Uh, so this is Nacho, uh, back in the day, uh, taking charge of, of, of the kickoff. You can see down there talking about width, limiting width, right? So that is something that we were struggling with. And well, uh, this is our first uh, portfolio Kanban uh, in 2019. And uh, well, this is me coaching a little bit some uh, KMM practices at the portfolio level. The way we decided to limit width was through tokens uh, for each team, right? So each team will have three tokens uh, why three? It was just uh, an hypothesis. We were we, we weren't sure if that was the capacity or if they had or the, if they have the right capability of delivering those three big initiatives. So we just wanted to experiment. Also, we uh, previously have already tried for uh, you know visualizing dependencies. Uh, this this thing with a with a string it didn't actually work, so they fell. So we came with the idea of you know what what if we uh, what if we created some shapes with the uh, same color and then do a little bit of uh, matching just to get to know if, you know, that initiative is dependent on, on, on this one just to get some uh, visualization, right? So six months later, after introducing those practices, uh, we were able to deliver 30 initiatives in 2,212 days. So that is probably around seven months or less. So uh, that was not really good because we were working at, at quarters, at portfolio level, but it is what it is. But at team level, you can see that we really, we really uh, uh, gained some improvement, right? So by that time, those teams were already KMM level number two, uh, meaning that they, had, uh, they, they were working as a team now. And you can see without shaping the demand of the portfolio, we had remembered those big outliers, the 85% of the work was what being done in 23 days or less. And now with the portfolio, we were shaping the demand 
and that allowed us to deliver in 13 days or less. But the big improvement was at the 95 percentile. You can see that we improved from 67 days to 24. We still had some outliers over there, but we were making progress. No, 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 no doubt about it. Uh, guess what? Same issue at the portfolio level now, right? It's really hard to with limit. I mean, uh, it seems really, really simple, but but it's not. So some new changes uh, were necessary, and uh, I had the opportunity uh, with natural support to spend uh, sometimes with my my little friends uh, over there at Seattle where I learned from a leadership uh, perspective and, and how to introduce changes from a coaching perspective in the ecosystem. And uh, the key takeaway for me was, if you want to introduce change, you know, yes, introduce a practice, the practice will distress the ecosystem, but you need a feedback loop. You need not just a way for us to learn, but, to, but, but for everyone. So I came with this idea of, you know what, let's put some metrics uh, available for all of us in front of the portfolio board and leadership. And that's, that, that is really key. And here I want to thank, uh, to thank Nacho because uh, he really supported me in signaling uh, the rest of the group that we, need, we needed to do a better job limiting work in progress. Uh, three months later, after those changes were introduced, we, we then uh, realized that we need to do a better job in managing work meaning that yes, we were striving to reap limit, but still the program manager was doing a lot of context switching between those initiatives. So we came with the idea of, you know what, what if we do, we, we translate the aging uh, into the physical board. So you can see these lines, those are days. So these epics uh, below are 90 days or uh, age, have, have been aged in, in, in 90 days. And uh, we introduced uh, new elements into the card as well. You can see the token there, it says focus. You know what? So there the program manager will say, you know, I am working in, on, on this initiative and I am guaranteeing that the, that the team is putting uh, all the focus and effort in finishing and not starting, right? Remember this big uh, uh, Kanban uh, way of saying, you know, stop starting, start finishing, right? So what happened, Alejandro? What happened after you guys introduced those changes? We finally, at the end of uh, November, I think it was, we finally got WIP under control and we have been keeping WIP under control ever since. So that is pretty cool. Now, if, you, if we compare six months of 2018, we were able to remember to deliver 30 work items uh, or less in almost seven months. And if we compare that with the first quarter of 2019, I mean, this is six months versus versus four months. I mean, there are, we, we, we still have two months ago. Uh, we were able to deliver 71 work items in three months or less. So we were really happy because we are already getting faster, right? That two times per month more, more productive and almost two times faster. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but what about user stories? I mean, if you remember the whole story, it all started because we wanted teams to deliver user stories in 14 days or less. And uh, of course, those, uh, the portfolio no doubt help us uh, achieve that because you can remember the histogram from 2018. And now take a look at the first immersive 2020, where we actually see that, this, that, that, that the system is more stable and that allows us to deliver what we needed. User stories in 14 days or less. Now we are aiming uh, to be consistent, right? We, now we want consistency. Uh, but what about people, Nacho? I mean, I am getting too technical with metrics, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Th those were a lot of metrics, uh, but actually what we are seeing is that for the first time, we are seeing true collaboration among team members. So uh, as I said at the beginning, we need to, to do a role transformation, a cultural transformation for every team player in, in, the, in the ecosystem, in, in the groups. So we are seeing the product managers and the agile coaches leading the portfolio sessions, but also the tech leads and the UX designers joining the sessions and getting a lot of value out of it. So they are seeing the value in the practice. And furthermore, the portfolio enabled some practices that were not there before. I mean, for instance, uh, I mentioned the dependencies that were a huge problem for us, but what we saw is that something that a dependency that arises in the past and can be months before anyone do something about it. 
Now in the portfolio session, when we identify the dependency, we have a conversation right after the portfolio session and discuss how we're going to tackle it, which are the priorities, how we're going to assign resources. So it was very, very helpful in, in terms of making a true collaboration happen. And in furthermore, uh, the portfolio, in the portfolio, we introduced new practices that were not necessarily re truly related to the common practice. For instance, we implemented aging between when a work item or a feature was released to production and when the value of that feature was measured in production. And in that way, it helped us improve our product practice and we, it helped us truly become a product auto-oriented organization. So it helped us in a, a, a million of ways. And of course, uh, stakeholders are now celebrating all over the galaxy. Uh, we are delivering value to production in a regular cadence. They have visibility of what's coming for the future, but furthermore, they are seeing that we are becoming much more predictable in terms of what we commit to do and when we commit to, to deliver that. And finally, to me, as chief product officer, this is a key tool for product strategy. We know where we are, we know where we are going, and if something needs to change, if we need to make a, a strategy change implementation, we can have a very much informed decision about what's happening and how this change that we're trying to introduce will impact the system. So uh, just to, to wrap up, we, it's just not both of us doing this work. Uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of talent that is helping us. And we are not done yet with these changes. We, we want to introduce, for instance, experiments and discovery to our portfolio visualization. Uh, but some kind of a, a meta learning we have from, from this experience is that through iteration and, and continuous improvement, we can achieve uh, a lot of things. So I, we know that our portfolio session is going to be the key to, to get us to a really solid product organization. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you. I think I hope that you take something away from that. But just before we jump to the questions, I want to ask one favor. If you can provide us some feedback. So as I, as, as I talk, if you can just uh, scan that QR code, uh, it's a two question survey, 10 seconds to answer. Uh, and of course, if you want to contact us, we, we are very open, very connectable. So you can reach us in, in any way. We are more than happy to, to continue discussing our implementation, our learnings with this experience. Thank you very much. Yes, we can ban. All right, great talk, Alejandro and Nacho. Um, great theme, lots of people loving the theme. Let's, let's hope the, uh, the empire doesn't strike back, but uh, it did not <laughs> <laughs> All right, so excellent. Um, so let's get some questions here. Uh, first one up. Um, I agree on the importance of metrics and data. However, how do you do how do you do it so that the analysis doesn't create paralysis? In other words, how do you avoid that the metrics themselves become blockers? I'll take that one if you want. Um, well, actually, the metrics. Uh, Per se, they don't generate this paralysis uh, analysis. It's I think it's us. Uh, metrics are there just to let you know if uh, those changes that uh, you introduce into the ecosystems are working or not. So if anything, they should enable uh, evolutionary changes. So if something gets introduced and it's working, cool. Uh, if not, then you have a feedback loop to enable you to make uh, another change. So that's that's my opinion. Yeah, if I can. Right. Uh, so, yep. Please do. Yeah. Um, basically, I think that we have a very experimental approach to it. So whenever we were trying to see if something would will change and we need a new metric, uh, will not be a paralysis, but rather how we can capture this information for future iterations. So I think that having that experimental mindset. I will use to not to stop uh, or, or paralyze because of the information you need, but rather keep improving and keep increasing the level of information you take to, to operate. Yeah. All right. Um, great. Thanks for that. And the next question up is, um, what are the different types of leadership challenges you faced? Um, how did you mitigate it? And, and did you have any specific techniques to remove any of the resistance? I can take that one if you want. Um, I think that we had many challenges in terms of, as we said, we, we were a very old organization or old fashioned organization. So we, we needed to transform 
people coming from, from PMO to, to a new model. So I think that uh, one of the key things that helped us is showing results. So as Alejandro said, we started implementing some, some, some practices in different teams at different times. And the progress of some teams, I mean, you always have teams that are early adopters. So those early adopters show sign of progress and we communicated that progress to the other teams and they saw the value they could get and they get excited and they started improving their practice. So I think that was very helpful. Kind of uh, even we introduced some competitions and, and that kind of stuff that helped us move uh, everyone uh, a step further. All right, great. Um, and this is a good one. So when, uh, when I was in Cancun, and you also mentioned this in the talk, you talked about that you overreached, that you, you came in and you tried to do things that, that, that you know, took over too much. Um, and you talked about it a little bit, but I wanted to give you, elaborate on that a little bit more. What were some of the specific things that you, that you did that you felt were overreaching? And then how did you recognize it? And, and how did you build recovery into it? How were you able to take that without just falling over from it? Well, I have overreached since 2018. <laughs> I actually didn't know that I was overreaching until I took the class uh, with David Anderson uh, last year. But uh, the thing uh, uh, for me in 2018, when we introduced the Kevin Maturity model, um, I thought there were like batches, you know, I want to collect them all. I want to have teams from zero, then maturity level number one, then maturity level number two. Then I thought that was the goal, right? I was, uh, of course, wrong. Um, and uh, well, you have to recognize, uh, of course, if there's something that you're doing good, uh, again, uh, good job. But if not, I think uh, we have to be able to recognize uh, if we are just pursuing things just for sake of, of, of getting a maturity level, right? It's, uh, we have to think about the outcomes of what we are doing, not just the practices, right, itself. So uh, what it actually helped me a lot was uh, having this class with David Anderson and then realizing that I was, you know, trying to be the smart guy on the room. And of course, that is, that is something that, uh, that is not really good, right? Because uh, you're you're there to help the teams the, the, uh, become better, right? So leadership again, <laughs> recognize your mistakes <laughs> and moving on. Okay, great. And then how did how were you able to to recover from it? How what were some of the things that you did? You know, when you uh, what did you pull back from? And how did you? I guess you mentioned you you, you got back to static was sort of basic. And was, is there more than yeah. that, or was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Actually, um, when I first started uh, working with the Kanban method, uh, I really loved the practices, right? But I, 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 I should have uh, gone much further on the on the changing on the changing principles. I think now those are really uh, true. There is the if if there's power in the Kanban method, I think are in the in the changing principles because it it's there. I mean. Uh, start with what you do now, right? Then you have to recognize, you, we need to have agreements, right? And and, and that's what I, I, I had with the team is, you know, guys, we are, we need to recognize that we are just following practices because we want to, to, to improve our camera maturity level, but it's actually not working because uh, not all the teams were moving at the same piece, right? And we thought we were doing, uh, we were not doing our job well. So uh, again, agreeing that we are, we were not doing the the the, the, the right thing uh, uh, um, first, me then the rest of the team, and then well, what's the problem that we were trying to solve, and uh, and then pursue an evolutionary an evolutionary change, and then acts of leadership at all levels, right? So uh, I think with the change management principles, those were the ones that uh, brought me back on. In, 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 into the force. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all, right. all right, great, great. That's ex excellent. And then uh, one more um, element here. We've been talking about resistance um, a lot, but you actually experienced the, the inverse of resistance. Um, you actually had uh, or other parts of the organization come to you and, and want some Kanban magic with, you know, I think it was finance and HR that had, had um, that, that I was witnessing there. Um, so talk a little bit about how that came about 
um, and also how you were able to to work with them while you're also you know and, and the fact that they are at potentially at a different level of maturity than than what you're experiencing with the uh, you know at the portfolio how did what did that learning come uh, how did that develop one take that Nacho or should I no go ahead. Uh, well, I think social proof, <laughs> uh, that is what actually enables other, other ones to look, you know, what you guys are doing, probably, you know, if that is giving some results, then someone else will ask and come to you and say, you know what, uh, we are having some problems. Uh, can you help us out? And, uh, and that is really cool because, uh, uh, I mean, again, acts of leadership, it's also recognizing that you need help, right? So, uh, the rest of the organizations saw that we were doing something different and uh, they saw that we were doing it right. So they come to us and say, you know what, can you help us out? Actually, we have a team that, uh, we didn't really gave them a, a lot of support. Uh, and, uh, they have been doing Kanban for more than a year now. We just actually gave them the in Kanban practitioner class, eight hours. And uh, those guys have been working with Kanban ever since. So, I mean, uh, acts of leadership again. So, um, social proof and again, acts of leadership. All right, excellent. Um, next question up, what were some of the impacts from a business outcome that you were able to obtain from limiting WIP limits at the portfolio level? Um, I think that the, the, if you look at it uh, by the end of our journey, what we got was a, a much better speed of delivery. And also through the portfolio management, what we were able to do was to focus on the things that were the most important for the business. So we were not only delivering more, but we were delivering more of what was more important. And we have the portfolio, we, we, we were not making that connection. I mean, we had teams were uh, receiving demand from, from anywhere and, and was uh, poorly managed or not, not uh, shaped in the way the, the whole organization wanted to, to, to go to. So we were able to actually select and, and put a product strategy in place and manage it through the portfolio. So I think it was great. And, and the, the results were there before the, this situation of the pandemic, but we were started seeing some, some very interesting results. And also the portfolio helped us uh, not only complete some, some features on some new risk production, but also measure it and, and communicate that to the to the stakeholders. That was very, very useful in terms of, of uh, showing and visualizing the, the value we were adding. All right, great. Uh, and the next question here is, how did you keep your leadership energy high? Um, leaders at times have short attention spans and, and you know, low tolerance for change. How did you cope with that? How did, how were you able to engage them? How were you able to demonstrate your leadership? How were you able to um, get your leaders on board and stay there? Well, uh, leadership do require a lot of energy, but if you love what you do, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, it, for me, it's like, uh, you want to really help uh, your organization to deliver value, right? So uh, it's not about uh, leadership itself, but it's it's about uh, you know uh, being there for for your team, for the organization to deliver value for your customers. That is what it actually is really all about. So I think, well, at least on my side, I, I take that energy from from you know uh, showing up every day. We try to do. Uh, uh, the things we do, the best way we can, and uh, improve and evolve. All right, well, thank you. Um, I think we're at the end of our time for Q&A. We have a lot more questions, but we'll be getting those to you. And thank you uh, again, it's great, great, uh, great story and uh, great success there. Excellent. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? May thank the you. floor be with you. <laughs> yeah, may the fourth be there. <laughs>